Good evening, folks. Ken Hoven here and the crew at Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama. It got chilly today, didn't it? Yeah. Woo! Bible says many are cold and a few are frozen. Uh, it's in Second Opinions, Chapter 5. Uh, anyway, we'll be continuing our uh, topic about the, uh, what's replacing what's going, has been in our seminar series. I've redone, uh, I've redone it about 20 times over the last three decades, and this is going to be the 21st time, and may take a while on this one. So please uh, be patient with us. Thank you for your, your patience. And we're going to get into it in just a minute. First, a couple quick announcements. It is uh, March 20, uh, 31st, last day of March here in 2019. If you want to come down and help us at Dinosaur Adventure Land, that'd be great. People come and go all the time. We have new ones, two new ones coming in tomorrow. Actually, two old ones returning tomorrow. Yeah, talk to them. Yeah, late at night. Praise God. So people come, some come, come back. Some we can't get rid of. But uh, if you want to help us build this place, come on down. We're having a blast. Had three baptized yesterday. That's a what, total of 40, I think, is the total. I have to go back and count them up. But, uh, more than the population of Lenox. More than the population of Lenox. Wow. Yeah. And the water was chilly. Sorry about that. But, uh, all right, brother. That was a good. That was good. Break. You've been waiting for that for how long? Five years. Five years. Amen. Anyway, thank you for joining us. We're going to, let's see, projects going on here. We could use an electrician, a couple electricians, for about three or four days to get all the stuff done. Carpentry work is going like uh, gangbusters. Plumbing work, we need a lot done of projects. Our anniversary is April 20th. That'll be one year we've been open. I'd like to get, and tomorrow's April 1st, so I'd like to get as many done as possible in the next three weeks. I mean, done, finished, cleaned up, done. Uh, greenhouse is looking great. Lake is looking better. One of the boats got loose. Did you see it wandered off over there? It got away from its brothers. Got away from his brothers. Okay, go nail, don't nail them down. Uh, all right, well, thank you so much. If you'd like to help support our ministry, I'll join our 777 Club. No pressure at all. We, if you want to help us, we're going to win souls and uh, serve the Lord as best we can, but we don't charge anything for people to come here. Uh, never have. And people can come and fish and get the gospel preached to them, and I love giving the tours of Dinosaur Adventureland. That grandma I gave the tour to today, when I said, you want the real tour or the grandma tour? The kids said, the real tour. I said, Grandma, what about you? She said, yeah, let's try it. Boy, she was <laughs> white as a sheet when we got done. <laughs> it was awesome. I love it. <clears throat> Sweetly, of course, in Christian love. Come on down, take the tour on the four-wheeler. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. You can join our 777 Club by going to drdino.com and click the Donate button and just give a one-time donation if you'd like uh, or uh, do something monthly, whatever the Lord lays on your heart. Hello folks, my name is Kent Hoven. We're going to be continuing our video series on the Creation Seminar Series. What does the Bible teach about creation? And where do dinosaurs fit in? And is the Bible scientifically accurate? We take the position that yes, the Bible is indeed scientifically accurate, flawlessly recorded for us, not a single mistake in the King James Version where I take that position. And we're going to show the Bible clearly teaches, we taught in the last session, that the earth is about 6,000 years old. I mean, if you add up the dates, and they're all given in Genesis 5, before the flood, and then Genesis 10 and 11, after the flood, you can add them up yourself, you'll come to the conclusion that the Bible teaches the earth is about 6,000 years old. Now we're going to look at some scientific evidences. Now I need to caution you before we get into this. We're going to start with space, the evidences from space that it can't be old, and then zoom in to evidences from earth, and then evidences from human population. But this one topic crushes the evolution theory completely, and they know it. If you take away time, it's like taking a pacifier from a baby. <laughs> time is their pacifier. See, if I told you if you kiss a frog, it will turn to a prince, you would all know that is stupid, that's a fairy tale. But somehow, if we give the frog billions of years, it'll turn to a prince. Oh yeah, now it becomes science. No, it's not science. It's still stupid. There is no way the universe or the earth can be billions of years old, as we'll cover in a minute. But this one topic receives more criticism. There are more anti hovind websites over this topic of the age of the earth and the age of the universe than any other topic I'm aware of. So we're going to start. I've gone through my seminar that I've given for the last 30 years. We've videotaped it about 20 some times. Uh, and you can still get the original series for 50 bucks for 18 hours, and it may be about four years till we get it all redone at the rate we're going. But I've gone through this many, many times. So I went through my, my presentation that shows the universe cannot be billions of years old. 
and freshened it up. I went all through Wikipedia and all through the internet and found fresh quotes and said, boy, nothing's changed. These, most of these are still valid proofs. They don't need to be updated, but I've updated things anyway, added new quotes, etc., to show that the Bible is indeed scientifically accurate. For example, galaxies are spinning, but the stars in the middle are going faster than the stars at the outside. So why do we still have spiral arms on the galaxies? I look today, astronomy.com. All disk galaxies rotate once every billion years. Well, if they rotate once in a billion years and they're 13.7 billion years old, shouldn't they have wound up 13.7 billion times? Or 13.7 times? Or at least be more wound up than they are. The very shape of the galaxies and the fact that the stars are moving different speeds in that galaxy, the fact that we still have spiral galaxies at all is an indication they cannot be billions of years old. Certainly not the 13.72984, whatever it is now they're teaching, billions of years old. Yes, ma'am. The, 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 there would be sm one smooth, homogeneous mass. They would not have any s distinct shape to them because the stars are moving different speeds. You can almost see six distinct lines in that picture. Right. Not only that, the galaxies are moving away from each other, we think. The, just, the, just the order of the galaxies shouts design. There must have been a creator. There's plenty of stuff on this on other websites like Answers in Genesis or uh, creationscience.com. Walt Brown's website is excellent. Um, this is a picture of a supernova ring. Once in a while, stars explode. They blow up. And it leaves behind a ring called a supernova ring. If it's a little one, they call it a nova. If it's a big one, they call it a supernova. Astronomers have observed about every 30 years, a star dies and explodes into a supernova. If the universe is billions of years old, why are there less than 300 supernova rings, dead stars? There should be several hundred million of them. Are the stars wrong or the evolution theory? Now this is back in 98 from ICR, Institute for Creation Research, so I thought I'd check it today. Humans have only a couple hundred, a couple of thousand year history of recording these events, and some are unreliable. Astronomers reckon there have been only three or four completely reliable observations of supernova in our galaxy. In recorded history, only three or four. From Quora.com. According to NASA, the supernova in the Milky Way occur approximately every 50 years or so. And so they say that a supernova occurs each second or less in the entire universe. Well, if there's a supernova occurring every second, why, where are they? It leaves a bright spot, a big ring behind. Some sources put it between 50 and 100 years, that is the period of supernova occurrence in the Milky Way. But it's not very consistent. Now hold on, Quora. If we get a supernova every 50 to 100 years, why have there only been three or four recorded in human history? Somebody is seriously wrong about this, okay? This is just in our galaxy. Just our galaxy is humongous, okay? To see a supernova in another galaxy, I think would be highly unlikely. They're claiming they can see these things. People don't comprehend the size of these galaxies and the distance between them. How many supernovas have been observed so far from Quora? This is Robert Newton, who studied at King's College. What does that mean? You took one night class? Wow studied at King's College, whatever, okay. Using telescopes, more than 10,000 have been observed in other galaxies. Robert, I'm going to have to doubt that. You're going to have to prove that to me. <laughs> 10,000 have been observed. We've only seen three or four in our galaxy, and we're in it. You really think you can observe more? Okay. But I will limit my answer mainly to our own Milky Way galaxy. Strangely enough, none have been observed in our galaxy since the use of telescopes in astronomy. Interesting. <laughs> They have all been naked eye objects. Humans have only about a couple thousand year history of recording these events, and some accounts are unreliable. Astronomers reckon there have been only three or four completely reliable observations of supernova in our galaxy. Okay, I agree. Well then, question, a lot of questions come up. Why aren't there more? Where is the evidence for this? Is this an indication that our galaxy is not billions of years old? Plus, I would like to point out, Your Honor, a star blowing up is exactly the opposite of what they need. 
They've never seen one form. You see stars blow up occasionally. This is the opposite of what the evolutionist needs as evidence. Why don't we ever see one form? Some say there are stars forming. They, they point to spots that are observed to get brighter. If a spot is getting brighter through the telescope someplace, there's all kinds of other possible explanations. A dust cloud in front of it is clearing. You got fog on your telescope lens and you wiped it off and whoa, the star got brighter. You're getting sleepy, you had too much vodka, whatever it is. There's all kinds of things to cause the... But if, if indeed you see a spot getting brighter, that is not evidence of a star forming. Nobody's ever proven even how a star can form. Are you saying that dust clouds can get together and make a solid? Would you please explain how you overcome Boyle's gas laws when you try to squeeze dust into a solid? I'd like to see how that happens. I'd like a scientific demonstration, please. I like the evidence. You can't squeeze dust clouds into solids. Some textbooks say the red giants evolved into white dwarfs over billions of years. Yes, boys and girls, it takes a hundred billion years to turn to a white dwarf. Really? This textbook says it takes billions of years for a red giant to slowly evolve into a white dwarf. Oh, you really? The Egyptian hieroglyphics back in 2000 BC described Sirius as a red star. Cicero in 50 BC said Sirius was red. Seneca said Sirius is redder than Mars. Ptolemy said Sirius is one of the red six red stars in 150 AD. Today Sirius is a white binary dwarf. Well, now hold it. If it went from a red star to a white star in less than 2000 years, why are we teaching the kids it takes a hundred billion years to go from a red star to a white star? Somebody is either lying or woefully misinformed. Scientific observation says it can happen quickly. And even then, going from a red giant to a white dwarf is the backwards to the evolution theory. That's not what you need, guys. You need something improving, not getting worse and burning out. Jupiter is cooling off. Skeptics have argued this is not a good proof for a young universe. Well. Jupiter is cooling off. I googled it here just recently. Jupiter and Saturn are the brightest planets in the solar system. Infrared observations of these gas giants have mapped weather patterns, observed asteroids and comets crashing through their atmosphere, and discovered a huge new ring around Saturn. Jupiter, the king of planets, is a gas giant. It's made mostly of gas like hydrogen and helium, and it doesn't have a solid surface in the way rocky planets like Earth do. It has a temperature of minus 230 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's cooling off. Want to hold it. If Jupiter is cooling off, and it's been observed that it's cooling off, how could it be billions of years old? Wouldn't it have you know, cooled off? If you came in the room and found a cup of coffee sitting on the table, and I said, don't touch the coffee, it's hot. And you said, whose is it? I said, I don't know, it's been sitting there for 300 years. <laughs> And it's still hot? Uh, I'm going to have to doubt that. <laughs> right? Yet they're telling the kids these planets are billions of years old, but they're losing heat. Hello? Jupiter has a moon called Ganymede. Ganymede has a very strong magnetic field. Well, not very strong, but a strong magnetic field. Magnetic fields are generated by the liquid motion of molten metal inside a body. Yet Ganymede should have cooled off billions of years ago. From the Denver Post, 25 years ago. They were scratching their head. How can this moon going around Jupiter still have a magnetic field? It should have cooled off. I agree. Could it be that maybe it's not billions of years old? I mean, is that even a possibility? Ganymede is the only moon in our solar system known to have its own magnetic field. It's believed the magnetosphere of Ganymede is likely to have been created through convection within the liquid iron core of the moon. Well, if Jupiter's minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit, its moon going around still has a magnetic field. Stop and think about that for a minute. Ganymede, the surprisingly magnetic moon. Creation.com has excellent stuff on this topic, by the way, if you want to get there. The largest moon in our solar system is Ganymede at Jupiter. Ganymede was one of the moons discovered or examined by the Galileo spacecraft, which orbited Jupiter from 1995 to 2003. Ganymede is 200 kilometers larger in radius than the planet Mercury. So it's a big moon. Many structures have been found on its surface that are still a mystery. During the Galileo mission to Jupiter, it was discovered that Ganymede possessed a weak magnetic field. 
This is very surprising to planetary scientists because in small objects like moons it's generally thought that any intrinsic field should have long since ceased to exist. And you can read all about it for yourself. So I have a question. If Ganymede is billions of years old, or if Jupiter is billions of years old, why does it still have the magnetic field? Should have cooled off. Saturn has rings around it. How many have ever seen? You see Saturn's rings through your telescope here? Yeah. Where's that six inch telescope, is it? Uh, it's right there. Well, That's, I think something's broken on that one. We have a couple telescopes here. Come out and watch the stars from Lenox, Alabama. You won't believe how cool they are to look at here. But Saturn's rings are moving away from the planet. They're unstable. They cannot possibly be billions of years old. Some are being pulled in. Saturn's rings give off infrared energy. How did this energy come? The vanishing rings of Saturn, Google just a few minutes ago. Saturn's rings are vanishing. Around the world, amateur astronomers have noticed the change. Saturn's rings are disappearing. Goodbye to Saturn's rings. Now hold it. If it's billions of years old, why does Saturn still have rings at all? If a planet has a bunch of rings and they're disappearing, wouldn't that be an indication it can't be billions of years old? Uh, the moon goes around the Earth. How many knew that already? And the Earth is round and it does rotate. Gee whiz. Okay. Young Age for the Moon and the Earth, writ article written many years ago, 1982, and still true. The moon is getting farther from the Earth. The moon is receding. It's leaving us. Bye, moon. Will the moon ever leave its orbit? Space answers. Dot com. Astronomy books are fond of quoting the fact that the moon is gradually spiraling away from the Earth. And it's because of our tides causing that. Okay? Why is the moon leaving us? Physics.org. The moon's orbit, its circular path, is indeed getting larger at the rate of 3.8 centimeters, about an inch and a half, every year. Well, now hold it. If the moon is getting farther away, this is going to be complicated. Okay, so listen carefully. The moon is getting farther from the Earth every year. So that would mean that it used to be closer. How many can figure that out with no help at all? Okay, even SpongeBob got it figured out. Okay, good. Well, if you bring the moon back in closer, you create a problem because the moon causes the tides. There's a law called the inverse square law. If you bring the moon into one third the distance, you take that fraction one third and flip it over and square it. It's nine times the gravitational pull at one third the distance. Inverse square laws apply. The closer they get, the force of attraction is much stronger. It applies to gravity, magnetism, light, and girls. You get too close, and you got never mind. But uh, the moon is receding. It is slowly leaving us. If you brought at 1.4 billion years ago, the orbit of the moon around the Earth would collapse. You, it can't go fast enough to stay in orbit. The gravity is too strong. And way before that, the tides generated on the Earth would have been horrendous. If the moon is closer, the tides would be higher, which would wash away all the continents over and over again. The evolution of the lunar semi-major axis, in other words, the distance to the moon, presents the well-known timescale problem. The lunar orbit collapses only a little over a billion years ago. They've known this for 25 years. So why are we still teaching the kids in school the Earth is 4.6 billion years old when just the moon puts it at less than 1.2 billion? And way before that, the moon would be much closer, causing tides that would be horrendous. And you think dinosaurs lived millions of years ago? Whew. I know what happened. The moon was so close, whizzing around, they got mooned. Banged them in the head and killed them all. Yeah, especially the tall ones. They all died first. Uh, comets have a tail because of material being blown off the comet. That's what the tail is. By the way, the tail on a comet does not indicate which way the comet is going. It indicates which way it is to the sun. The comet could be going this way, but the solar wind blowing that way. So the tail of the comet does not indicate the dis direction to the sun. Who cares? Well, short period comets have a life expectancy of less than 10,000 years. If stuff is always being blown off the comet, I mean, if it's always losing and losing, pretty soon it's going to be, like, gone, right? You can't just keep losing and losing. Halley's Comet, quite well known since it passes sun every 75 years, this comet will be completely subliminated, uh, so, yeah, subliminated, sublimated. Sublimation is where it turns from a solid straight to a gas. And disappear after only 10,000 years, or about 100 rotations around the sun. This is a typical lifetime for a comet. 
access today. Now, wait a minute. If comets only last 10,000 years, I got a question. You can't just keep losing. See, if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall. How many have experienced that before? Okay, All right. For instance, old Earth creationist Hugh Ross, Hugh Ross claims that the lifespan of Halley's Comet is 10,000 years, whereas other comets have given an average lifespan of approximately 2,000 years. Disintegration is directly related to the orbital period. The more times it passes the sun, the more stuff gets blown off. Pretty soon, it's gone. But in the flashcards they use for the kids to learn in school, shouldn't all comets be gone? Yes, but there are more comets stored in deep freeze beyond Pluto. What is the reservoir of cold comets beyond Pluto called? They know this is a problem. Comets are constantly being blown apart. So they've got a solution. They say, well, there's a deep freeze full of comets out there that keep sending new ones in to replace the ones that burn out. Once so deflected into short period comets, these comets must have comparatively short lifespans. Astronomically speaking, probably no short period comet can survive more than 10,000 years. This has been known for 50 years. Okay, I debated a guy, uh, no, I had a, a, one guy devoted an entire website against me, Madsen. He said there are hundreds of, uh, uh, well, I answer these by the way on our YouTube channel, try to answer the skeptic. You can call, I've had 164 debates now with evolutionists and I'll debate any more. Uh, send your best three evidences for evolution and we'll glad schedule a time to defend them, okay? Someone said, Hovind, you're taking a lot of flack. He must be right over the target. Oh, I know. On this, on this issue of the age of the Earth and the age of the universe, this is the target right here. Because if you could prove the Earth is not billions of years old, nothing else matters in the evolution argument. Nothing. This is the target, and they're going to hate this one. In 1950, this is what the atheist said. Based on a study of the orbits of several long period comets, the Dutch astronomer Jan Oort proposed, that means he hoped, he wished, he prayed, that a great shell of comets existed at the remote frontiers of our solar system. Oh, so there's a deep freeze of comets out there to send in new ones. Okay. Hmm, they replace the ones that burn out. Better statistics in more recent years have supported the existence of the Oort cloud, after the Dutch astronomer named Oort and put it at a distance of 50,000 astronomical units. What is that? Well, an astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. That's a long ways, 93 million miles. That's like getting a ruler, and okay, let's get a new ruler for these big numbers, because if I told you so many trazillion inches to the Moon, it wouldn't matter. It's better to do it in miles. It is 1.2, I think, 1.2 light seconds to the Moon. At the speed of light, it would take about maybe one and a half seconds to get to the moon. At the speed of light, it would take eight minutes to get to the sun. So that's called one astronomical unit. All right? Pluto is 39 astronomical units from the sun. And you can't see that without a really good telescope. Seeing a comet at 50,000 astronomical units is impossible. You guys are dreaming. See, nobody has ever seen the Oort cloud. It would be hard to see a comet one astronomical unit from the Earth if it weren't for the tail being blown off. It sounds like they're doing the same thing that they're doing with the edge of the Earth. They're just making it so vast and large that it's just, oh, yeah, you Whoa. have to believe it's down. Impress them with the giant numbers. Yep, yeah, exactly what it is. Oort never saw the Oort cloud. That's named after him. Oort proposed a cloud of comets surrounding the solar system based on mathematical errors. They've known this since 1974. Oort was wrong. There is no Oort cloud. Many scientific papers are written each year about the Oort cloud, its properties, its origin, its evolution, yet there is not a shred of direct observational evidence for its existence. That's Carl Pagan, a Sagan. He knows there's no Oort cloud. Nobody's ever seen it. There's no proof of it. By the way, this article said the Oort cloud is an extended shell of icy objects that exist in the outermost reaches of our solar system. Now hold it. If from Sun to Pluto is 39 astronomical units, are you saying 50,000 astronomical units is still part of our solar system? What's the difference between 50,000 and 39? Yeah, a lot, okay. Jan Oort, who first theorized its existence, the Oort cloud is roughly spherical. 
and is thought to be the origin of most of the long period comets that have been observed. Now you're claiming you know it is spherical? They do this and they don't put this to scale. They go to the 10th power. This is a trick to trick the eye into thinking, well, yeah, the Oort cloud is just right out there. Oh, no. If comets are boiling away, why are there any left from curious astronomer Cornell University? How do comets survive when so much of their mass is outgassed when they come close to the sun? They come close and it blows stuff off. It says they don't. Comets which orbit the inner solar system are very short-lived, lasting no more than a few tens of thousands of years on average. We still see comets this late in the solar system's lifetime. Of course, they're thinking it's billions of years. Because new comets occasionally fall in toward the sun from the Oort cloud. A spherical cloud of comets about 50,000 times as far from the Earth as the, from the Sun as the Earth. Really? Is the Hubble telescope able to give us real proof of the Oort cloud? No, it's not. Now, how does the Oort cloud know that a comet is big? At least one at a time instead of leave, releasing ten. You do not ask questions to embarrass the evolutionists, okay? They've got their theory. They like their freedom from God. Don't confuse them with the facts, okay? They got, some, they got somebody with like a TV yeah. remote. Objects in the Oort cloud, believed to be 100,000 astronomical units from the sun, would be impossible to observe even with the best telescopes today. So the Oort cloud can still only be inferred from the orbits of long-period comets. So you see a comet come in, you look at how it has a slight curve to its orbit, and you're calculating from that 100,000 astronomical units away? What kind of calculator do you have to crunch those numbers? This guy Matson, this atheist, said, Sorry, fellas, if you want to use the comet argument, it's up to you to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the Oort cloud and other sources don't exist. Whoa, stop the music. Think about that for a minute. He's trying to shift the burden of proof. I have to prove there is no Oort cloud. This is exactly, this is, suppose I said, watermelons are blue on the inside until you cut the skin. As soon as you cut the skin, it turns red. Prove I'm wrong. It's impossible to prove. Uh, right. It's called shifting the burden of proof, which is what they're trying to do here. He says, I have to prove there is no Oort cloud? Dave, stop and think for a minute. I don't know where you went to school, but they didn't give you good logic on this one. You have to prove it does exist. See, you guys want to use all of our tax dollars to spread your religion in the school system. I think you ought to go start your own private school and teach evolution to anybody dumb enough to want to come learn it. But see, they know nobody would come. You couldn't have a school privately funded to teach evolution. You have to use government subsidy to get there, don't you? And we know why. Okay, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. It's interesting. Evolution theory has the sun and stars evolving before the earth, right? God said he made the earth before the sun and stars. Actually, actually everything about the evolution theory is backwards to the Bible. The Bible says he made the earth before the sun. Evolution has sun before the earth. The Bible says he made the oceans before he made the land. Earth was underwater and then he made land. Evolution has land cooling down from a hot molten mass and then the oceans forming. Exact opposite. The Bible says the light came before the sun. God is light. Evolution has sun came before the light. Land plants came first. No, no, marine life came first, according to evolution. Fruit trees came before the fish. No, nope, fish came before the fruit trees. In the, whales came before the insects. No, nope, insects came before the whales. Here's their stupid geologic column. See, insects evolved before the whales. Everything about this theory is completely backwards to what the Bible teaches. There is no compromise. Somebody is wrong. And I enjoy showing them who they are. So, the Bible says he made the plants before the sun. Hmm. Which means it had to be like one or two days till the sun came up or the plants are going to die. This day age theory is dumb. Plants can make it a day or two with no sun, but they can't make it a thousand years. Bible says marine mammals made before land mammals. Birds came before reptiles. Evolution says no, reptiles came before birds. Actually, the reptiles turned into birds. Can't believe that guy now is building a giant T-Rex model with feathers all over it. Oh, wow. That is a special kind of stupid. I mean, it takes, you'd have to study for years to be that dumb. Atmosphere between two layers of water. Evolution says there was atmosphere above the water. The Bible clearly teaches that man brought death into the world, right? 
Evolution says death brought man into the world. Many people don't understand the importance of this one right here. See, in the evolution theory, death is the hero. If one animal evolves a little better than the rest, what has to happen to the rest of them? They've got to die, or this new improved gene will be just blended back into the population. I don't think people understand the importance of this one right here. Did man bring death into the world, or did death bring man into the world? Sounds like a final solution to me. The final solution, exactly right. And Adolf Hitler was just trying to speed up the process. Let's find out who the superior race is, which he thought was the blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Norwegian, for the story to tell the dog, oof, the hater fella, you betcha. And everybody else was inferior. Check out Hitler's hit list on my video number five. When they came and arrested me to put me in prison, they said, get every DVD number five you can find. And they searched all over our place, far and wide, to get the video number five, The Dangers of Evolution. That's the one they hated. Might want to check that out. Get the whole series for 50 bucks. It'll be a couple of years till we get to redo that one. Do you think they even dis disclosed that they were interested in that? That's well, I was kind of showing their, their, their hands. The reason they're interested in this, I think, is very simple. Well, I'll get to it in a minute. But the founders of this country said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain rights. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Where do rights come from? Creator. The creator. But they would like to say, oh no, you don't have a right to drive unless you get our permission. You don't have a right to get married unless you get our license. You don't have a right to do anything. You don't have a right to breathe unless you get our permission. This is headed right into the one world government, new world order, where you got to get a permit for everything. And actually, in law, if you get a marriage license, they will call you a creature of the state. Right. If you get a marriage license, that's what they call you. That's another long rabbit trail. I kicked a few of those dogs as I went by on video five, and that's what they hated. A creature of the state. A creature of the state. A corporation is a creature of the state. Interesting. In 1973, the Supreme Court was ruling over the abortion issue. And they said, the word person does not include the unborn. That's correct, because they create a person when they issue a birth certificate. They didn't say it's not a human. They didn't say it's not alive. They said it's not a person. You, you don't want to be a person. I don't want to be a person. Yeah. You want to give your, your number, have people call you if they got more questions on that, Paul? A man created in God's image. A man created in God's image. But this is, this is a critical difference that people don't understand. And it goes back to... Evolution versus what the Bible says. If the Bible is right, God created man. If evolution theory is right, man created God. Isn't that what the kids are taught in school? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we came up from the apes and slowly came up with the idea of, you know, let's create a God. It could not be more opposite. People say, could God have used evolution to do the creating? There are those who try to compromise the two theory. That's not the God of the Bible, that's for sure. The God that would use evolution is cruel, wasteful, and retarded, in my humble opinion. Watch my video number seven, where we answer all sorts of questions on this, on this topic. King David said, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? I think it'd be good for us to just take time to consider the heavens. Go lay out there and watch the stars. Just consider the heavens. Take time to consider. Psalmist said, while I was musing, the fire burned. Something started burning in my heart while I was musing. What does muse mean? Well, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the works of thy hands. All men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not. Muse means to stop and think. Really stop and think. See, a theist is a person who believes in God. If you put the letter A in front of a word, in English, quite often it means the opposite. So an atheist is a person who claims he does not believe in God. Muse means to think. Put the letter A in front, you get amuse, which means to not think. <laughs> but you know, they've got entire parks dedicated to that, that very thing right there. Amusement parks, a place, a place to not think. That's what the word means, amuse. When I consider thy heavens, 
Take time to consider, what is man that thou art mindful of him? But Satan has so many people distracted now with amusements. They're all worried about who can hit the ball over the fence or who can run with the ball. I asked, made a comment a couple days ago on the broadcast. I said, what do they do with all these points after the game? Do they save them in a box? Can you spend them on something? When I take the tour around here, we've got some trees in the far corner over there of the property, that huge pine trees, and all the branches are growing one direction. They curve and go out this way. How many have seen those ones before on the tour? I stop when I point that out. I say, why don't these trees send some branches back this way? All the branches curved and went right out this way. They said, well, there's no sun on this side. I said, that's right. A tree with no brain is smart enough to put its energy into something that's going to produce something for the tree. It's not going to waste time putting out a limb if it's not going to produce anything. How, how many hours have been spent on things that are not going to produce anything? I can understand, this is what I say in my tour, I understand a three-year-old playing with a ball for a while, but I do not understand a bunch of 30-year-olds watching more 30-year-olds play with a ball for five hours. I don't understand that. What does this produce? <laughs> Have you thought about that? Like, what are you doing? As a kid, I had a baseball card collection. I was all, did all that kind of stuff, you know, and watch Willie Mays, you know, say, hey, Willie, you know, with his basket catch out there with his big glove, had a big Willie Mays glove, and I thought, boy, this is great sports, and I stopped to realize, this is unprofitable. What good is this going to do? It's been estimated there's enough stars out there that are visible from Earth that everybody on Earth can own 11 trillion of them to yourself. Those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones that we don't know about. I think you'd be wise to do what David said, consider the heavens. When I consider thy heavens. Just go lay down and consider the heavens. And every star might have 50 planets around it. Well, and it says God, num it says he, he numbers the stars. That doesn't mean he knows how many total. That means he knows the number of each one. Yeah, this is star number 427658. You know, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. They found a spot in space above the Big Dipper. They thought it was black. Nothing there. So they focused in on it and zoomed in on it and count for 10 days and took pictures. It's the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. After 10 days of viewing that spot, there were more stars than they could count. Hubble Deep Field North. The Hubble Space Telescope, searching for evolving galaxies in December of 1995, focused for 10 continuous days on a tiny patch of sky the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. This picture of that tiny patch of sky is called Hubble, Hubble Deep Field North. Ones they didn't know about. I think we should say, wow, what a mighty God we serve. These are the few of the very numerous scientific evidences from space that the Earth cannot be, the universe cannot be billions of years old. And remember now, you take away time, they're going to cry like a baby with no pacifier. Mark my, watch the comment section, okay? We're going to zoom into the Earth. Tomorrow night we'll talk about some of the proofs from the Earth. The Bible says, speak to the Earth and it shall teach thee. Is there any way to show from Earth that it's not billions of years old? What are some things about the Earth we could look at? Well, the Earth is spinning. The Earth has a population that is growing. The Earth has oceans that contain all kinds of minerals and salts and things like that. Different things are washing into the oceans, but when evaporation takes place, it only pulls out the water, leaves those minerals behind. Could we see how fast the metals or minerals are coming in and calculate how long it took to get that concentration? I think you'll be surprised. There are many ways to prove this Earth is not billions of years old. But if you've been duped into thinking it is, I'm sorry, we're here to help. Call 855-BIG-DINO and we'll explain it to you. God made the world in six days. If you'd like to get our video series or any of our material, call 855-BIG-DINO, extension 1. 50 bucks for the whole thing. And it's been our policy for nearly 30 years now. You can get them, take them home, copy them all, send them back, get your money back. You can't beat a deal like that. I used to loan my videos out. I learned right away that Christians don't steal, but they do borrow and never return. So you can't borrow it. Take it home, pay for it, take it home, copy it, bring it back, get your money back. You show me somebody else that does that. I'd like to meet that person. If you'd like to come uh, help us build this place, come on down. Spend some time at Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama. Thank you so much. Push thumbs up, like us, subscribe, and do all that stuff. And tell other folks about our channel and our ministry. We don't advertise much at all. 
other than here on YouTube. So if you want to help us spread the word that we're out here. If you'd like to have a debate, get your atheist friends to say, call Kent Hoven. You call, say, call Kent Hoven, 855-BIG-DINO, extension 3. And I'll answer any questions I can. And if they're not saved, I'll lead them to the Lord right over the phone or try to. All right, see you tomorrow. Bye.